On this episode, we'll be talking, listening, captioning, reading, however way you communicate in about disability in documentaries. Yes, this podcast just got real. This is Reed Davenport. This is Basic Able. Alright, a little joke for you. A podcast owes you a terrible policy, and it sounds as though know, it's Father Griffin that won't enter the studio. Well, actually, the joke is on you, because you have to listen to find out what happens. <laughs> My first guest has mixed and designed sound for almost... 250 films, including The Kill Team and Football We Trust and Bad Santa. He is currently co-directing Crip Camp, which is the story of Camp Jannad and its summer camp awakenings that will transform lives and shape the future of the disability rights movement of the 70s. For those of you who are listening, allow me the privilege of describing Jim to you. He has luscious curly hair, dons a chain with a wig on it, and looks like he is still a little stoned from a great protect concert that took place back when Jerry was still around. <laughs> In fact, this is the first time I've ever seen him without a tattoo shirt. Welcome, Jim. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Reed. First off, I didn't mix Bad Santa. I'll, I, 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 did, I did some work on it, but this is just me being a Boy Scout, okay? Yeah. I, uh, um, Were you Boy Scout? No, they wouldn't. Let, they wouldn't let me in. Wait, are you serious? Yeah, my father wanted me to be in the Boy Scouts, but I'm sixty, almost sixty-two years old. So, yeah, they wouldn't let me in. Wow. Yeah, but I overcame that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> now you've been working in documentary as a sound designer for decades, and you've seen documentaries of all sorts. But I want to hear. Some patterns when it comes to disability. Uh, you know, the, I think you can talk about the tropes around disability in narrative films separately from documentary. And by nature, documentaries really are more about the truth and revealing the truth and showing it in a way that is um, uh, compelling. Whereas narrative films, for the most part, you know, if the cripple doesn't want to die, I mean, why bother making the film, right? I mean, it's, it's. We've certainly seen um, some variations on that, but not a lot. But in the documentary world, I probably have worked on, you know, let's say, you know, about maybe ten to a dozen films dealing with disability, but they've all been rather wonderful. And I got to tell you, um, <clears throat> even if the, you know, even if I was close to bankruptcy, if it was a film that really didn't show disability in an honest light, there's no way I could, I, I would work on it. Reagan Brashear's film Fixed really was kind of a modern, a more recent kind of discussion about technology and disability. Jen Brea on Unrest, which really focused on her um, acquiring ME or chronic fatigue syndrome. And I will not uh, try to uh, attempt to uh, pronounce myalgic, myalgic encephal. Sorry, folks. I I need more coffee for that. Nice try, though. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm, I'm, um, There's Jen. She's a graduate student at Princeton, and she's had a really you know bad fever, and then afterwards like basically has you know developed these symptoms where there's no energy and she'd been thinking about maybe doing documentary work but she decided that she needed to document how she was doing because the doctors wouldn't believe her and she started filming on her iphone and in 
and over the course of I don't know how, exactly how long, but at least a couple of few years, she wound up making this film that was extraordinary look at people with ME and what the science or non-science is about it, the absolutely pitiful amount of money that goes into researching this, um, people thinking that it was just something that was uh, psychiatric and not phys- uh, uh, you know, actual physical problem. Here's your tip. You know what I did to myself, I don't think I can get up off the couch. I feel like my brain is misfiring. Sometimes I wouldn't be able to speak. Wow. If you say too little, they can't help you. And if you say too much, they think you're a mental patient. Unrest it premiered at Sundance. It's been on PBS. And it is... It is played throughout the world. It got short this right? Yeah. So the documentary world for the Oscars, there were like about 180 films that qualified. And then that gets whittled down to 15 films, which is the short list. Yep. So she made the short list, didn't make it to the final five. But, um, uh, but the film has done amazing amount of good in regards to raising awareness about ME, chronic fatigue syndrome. And... But also on top of all that, it shows her filmmaking. And there are times where she wasn't going to be able to travel to England, but figured out the technology to allow her to direct remotely. She was directing some of the shoots from her bed. Yep. I think this is actually really an amazing time right now because people like Jason De Silva's film When I Walk and Jen Bray's film Unrest, that they have... You know, made it to the motherland of Sundance. Can you go through your mental facilities and kind of try to also talk about the the bad portrayals of disability? It's a tough one because you... There are some extraordinary people who have done things, right, that are pretty mind-blowingly good. It all matters how you frame things. And if you're giving somebody praise and putting them up on a pedestal for doing something that isn't very extraordinary to the to the general disabled population, then that's kind of saying, boy, it's great. He actually got his pants on today. Now, you and I have both done work in film, and my work mostly deals with disability. So I've opened myself up to being pigeonholed, but you came in a different way as someone who just relied on their talents to break into a career. Was that difficult? And as you've become one of the most prominent sound designers in the Bay, has your relationship with your disability identity changed that's a wonderful question i you know i uh i so when i was 15 or 14 actually at camp Jeanette, i met judy human and judy had been a camper at camp Jeanette and then became a a, a counselor and judy uh had I guess in the summer of uh, the summer of seventy one, she had just previously prevailed in a lawsuit against the the New York City School District because they wouldn't give her a teaching position because she had post polio and used used a wheelchair, and and her involvement in doing that was really kind of a real kind of beacon for me, and she was one of the early people with disabled in action in New York. And so I became active in high school. When I went off to college, I helped uh, found the Disabled Students Union at UC San Diego um, and was stayed politically active. But out of college, I got a job at the Berkeley Repertory Theater as their resident sound designer. And I really had no time for anything but my job and, you know, and laundry. But I kind of drifted away from my activism because I really needed to do whatever I could to, you know, focus on my career. And, and, and um, I felt bad about that. I felt like I, 
wasn't really contributing the way that I wanted to. And interestingly enough, um, in one of our interviews we've done with Judy Human for Crip Camp, she said, oh, Jim, we all had our eyes on you. You know, you kind of, it was kind of like saying you had a real job, not that the jobs at CIL or at WID and other places weren't real jobs, but they, they saw me out there really as excelling in a business in which I was really just the, I was the only person in a wheelchair doing what I was doing that I was aware of. Right. I'm here with Jim DeBrett. We'll be right back. I'm here with uh, Reed and we're going to take a short break. We have the top 10 times you're watching a basic disability documentary. If you see three of these in a flick, then that shit is basic. Number 10, the main character with the disability is interviewed less than his or her family or friends. Number nine, there is an image of a cat skin that is used with voiceover explaining a specific condition. Number eight, there is a scene where a person with a disability gets out of bed and brushes his or her teeth. Number seven, the disabled person is the only one subtitled. Number six, Family member explains how their loved one's disability has transformed their own lives. Number five, the filmmaker thinks he or she is the first person to realize disabled people are sexual. Number four, anyone at any point calls someone with a disability inspirational. Number three, a doctor's appointment scene. Number two, a person with a spinal cord injury explains where on their body the injury occurred and what that means. Think T number something. And the number one sign that you're watching a basic disability documentary at the end of the movie you realize that shouldn't have been the movie. Jimmy. The dulcet tones of Teddy Pendergrass. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Were you ever a DJ? No, I would have loved to have done radio. You, you have a great voice for it. Yeah, I have a yeah, I have a great face for radio too. Yeah. So it's yeah. That's an old joke. That one goes back to the sixties. I have a great. I have a great voice for close captioning. <laughs> <laughs> so, Crip Camp. Uh, a couple of years ago now, uh, Nicole Noonan and I um, just, uh, came together to do this documentary called Crip Camp. And it's a documentary that starts off at a summer camp I went to in the very early 70s in uh, in the Catskills of New York, the Hunter, New York. And it was a really revolutionary summer camp. And, and we, um, you know, imagine a summer camp for the quote-unquote handicapped run by hippies. You kind of get the, the picture that it was a really kind of, a, you know, kind of broke a lot of the stereotypes of what it was like to go to a summer camp for the handicap. You know, uh, we weren't patients. We were campers. You know, we weren't people that had to go to bed at 8 o'clock. We were people who were staying up all night listening to music with the counselors. And I had heard rumors that you could smoke dope with the counselors. So I, I said, Dad, I want to go to a new summer camp next year. Okay, Jim, that's fine. We're really kind of looking at the camp and the fact that you don't know a you can't strive for a better life if you don't know it exists. And this is one of the things we learned at that camp. And that Berkeley, with the Center for Independent Living, provided the kind of support that people needed to live independently. And that's why people were drawn to Berkeley uh, from my community. And so we're going to look at the early days of CIL, independent living movement, and then also look at the, H, uh, the 504 sit-in. 
because so many people from Camp Jeanette were not uh, were were working at CIL, and a number of people are on the inside at the Senate at the federal building, and then kind of from there the kind of coda is well what is the kind of what is the aftermath of this time and this experience, and what are people's lives now and and how did this experience really affect them? We're not talking about just campers. We're talking about counselors and staff members. Um, and I'm just a really big believer that it's a universal story, that you have to know a better life is possible. And with really not a huge amount of support, people are able to achieve an amazing things and have really wonderful, fill, fulfilling lives. And not just fulfilling for them, fulfilling for other people that are their friends and they come in contact with. And it's a very small price to pay um, um, to make this all very achievable. Thank you so much, you do. I really appreciate you coming in. I really appreciate the time with you. Thank you, Reed. One of my guests today is A.G. Murray. I was amazed at A.G.'s acting ability as he played a man with cerebral palsy going to film camp in the film Becoming Bulletproof. Then I realized the film was a documentary and that A.J. was a man with cerebral palsy going to film camp. Nevertheless, Daniel D. Lewis has nothing on this dude. You never really see anybody with a disability on TV. Right, A.J. Action. I don't know if I'm crazy, but... My dream is to become a professional actor. Welcome from Atlanta, AJ. So the first documentary you appeared in was Becoming Bulletproof. Sounds like a sequel to The Terminator. Were you a cyborg? Oh, uh, well, it... It depends on it depends on who you ask. Let's just say I was a willing participant. So for those of you who haven't seen the documentary Becoming Bulletproof, it's about a field camp for uh, adults with disabilities where they make films. So it was a movie inside of a movie that is now the topic of a podcast. Watch out for that rabbit hole. And AJ, you played the mayor. Did you have any sex scandals? No. I wish I had. I'm a very clean mayor. A very clean mayor. A very clean and pure mayor who just does his job to, to serve the people of uh, Prairie Town. You sound like the typical politician that we shouldn't trust. Well, I hope it, I don't mean to make it sound like that, although I've I've heard that before. This episode we're talking about documentary portrayals of people with disabilities, and you were the main subject for becoming bulletproof. Do you think the film fell into any tropes that we typically see um, when portraying disability? I don't think so, but I know that I can be a little impartial. It was a long process for the director uh, getting this story on camera into the screen precisely because uh, the directors of Zeno Martin Farm don't want, didn't want like any uh, typical portrayals that you see of people with disabilities. I know from a firsthand experience that there was several hours and hours of discussion about how this community and group of very close friends was going to be portrayed because um, this is something that we all care about. They were very intimate 
part of the film um, that involved your daily routines. What made you so open about filming them, and uh, do you regret it? No, no, not at all. Um, as a matter of fact, um, that was, to me, that was absolutely at the forefront of telling um, my part of the story in the documentary uh, because I knew that um, what the director, uh, Michael Barnett, was trying to get across, I had no problem uh, showing my showering. Um, I had no problem, you know, there's spots in the film where I talk about um, uh, my sexuality and my sexual frustration. I had no problem talking about those things or showing my feeding. Why? Because that's a part of everyday life. Not that, I, that not that I'm every person with a disability, but I knew that this could be one glance into a world that's not really in the mainstream. So I wanted to be as transparent and as open as possible. Um, so what are you working on now? Um, I did an episode of Speechless. I, I got to work with Micah Fowler and Minnie Driver. It's a really funny episode. It's the season finale. Did, and, you, um, did you get Minnie's number? No, you know, of course, you all, you always think about that, but you want to, you know, I want to be, I want to remain in a gentleman. I did, however, manage to get a hug. That sounds well worth an episode. She is incredibly sweet and incredibly warm. Very, very funny. And, and, and Micah Fowler is just the... The light of that said, he was always giving me um, really like high compliments and praise. He's he's a really he's a really really good, uh, solid um, young man. So uh, shout out to um, the whole speechless cast and crew, and definitely Micah Fowler and and Minnie Driver. Shifty years of it, you appeared on the season of Drunk History, the episode on Judy Human and the 504 Sid. And I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I was wondering if you could uh, recite the line you had in the episode. Fuck you. Uh, excuse me? Fuck you. Um, I, I, I don't know what I did to offend you. The line was, fuck you. I see, I see. Well, AJ, I, I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for today. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really, really stoked to be here, and I hope in some capacity uh, we could do it again. I think, I think we must. Yes, we should. I want to read a post AJ recently wrote on Facebook. Growing up being a TV geek and a dreamer, I've always yearned to see someone like me on television. Not just brown skin, but wheelchair spastic and embracing themselves as they are. Not wanting to be someone else but proud and accepting of themselves. Not making excuses or trying to be something they're not. Not focusing on being what society thinks as the norm, just representing their version of normal. This show speechless has meant the world to me ever since I found out about its conception. I voiced my request to the universe, and I must have burned the ears off all of my friends and family on almost a daily basis 
talking about how much I wanted to be a part of the groundbreaking show on ABC. Well, tonight I watched myself on the season finale and I loved it. I embraced every part of it and I am proud of the cast and crew and viewing audiences for allowing, supporting, and redefining what normal truly is. May season three continue opening doors and changing the fabric of our world as we realize we're more like than we are different. Basic Able is presented by Through My Lens and made possible through a grant from the Ford Foundation. Producer Basic Able is Dentoya Newton, executive producer Dan Lee, came up for this episode, Daniel Chavez Antiveros, Isaac Krieger, and Scott Clark King. Captioning Cheryl Green. Visit ThroughMyLens.org to find out more about how we're disrupting media portrayals of disability and how to get involved. This is Reed Davenport reminding you that in the words of Coolio, you gotta get up to get down. Thank you for listening watching or reading Beast of Gable. Till next time.